Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to day 19 of the Level Up Symposium. My name is Andrew Scriver, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to Playformance, the synthesis of cultural intangible movement and interactive technology, uh, presented by the Associated Designers of Canada with uh, support from Toaster Lab's Mixed Reality Performance Atelier. I am one of the co-curators of the symposium and a member of the ADC, and I am very happy to be your host for this event. I would like to, of course, first acknowledge that I am coming to you from uh, the settler city of Montreal, known as Chachage by the current caretakers of land, the Ghanaian Gahaga Nation, which is and uh, was long before the colonizers arrived, a place of conference, conflict, and creativity for many indigenous peoples, including the Anishinaabe, the Huron-Wendat, and Abenaki peoples. Uh, the name Chachage means broken in two for the way that the river splits around the island. I am honored and humbled to be able to be here to share and create with you all, and so I offer my thanks for that. So, in the spirit of gratitude, I would like to thank the Canada Council for the Arts, who are the primary supporter of the symposium as a whole, as well as our other sponsors, IATSE, the University of British Columbia, Theatre Alberta, CITT Alberta Chapter, Concordia University, Ryerson University, York University, and all of our individual donors, of course, thank you so much. Uh, I'd also like to thank all of our volunteers, our presenters, and our attendees for making this symposium so special for all of us. Thank you very much. Uh, for your information, all symposium events will be recorded and made available on our website in a freely available archive uh, within a few days of the event. Uh, so thank you everyone for joining us here uh, in the stream. You're watching this live stream either on the Level Up website, which is levelup.designers.ca, on HowlRound through our partners at Toaster Lab or on the respective Facebook pages of the ADC or Toaster Lab. Now, regardless of your viewing platform, embedded on the same page as the video uh, is the chat function in the top right-hand corner of your screen. You can click on the little chat bubble to uh, put in any questions or comments that you have uh, at any time during the presentation. Um, any questions that you have uh, are will, will be read out uh, either by our presenter or uh, by me after his presentation. Uh, so this event can be enjoyed through auditory or visual access or a combination of both. As I said, uh, either myself or our presenter will read the questions all aloud. Uh, and this information will also appear visually at the bottom of your screen. Uh, visual access is also supported with captioning for all speakers and uh, the captioning will appear directly below the active speaker. So if you require technical assistance to support your access, please email levelup at designers.ca for immediate support or to provide feedback following our events. Uh, and if you enjoy this session or any of our other sessions during the symposium, please consider donating any amount that you can to the Associated Designers of Canada to support our national arts service organization in achieving its goals of advocacy, mentorship, and industry promotion. Don donation links are available on all viewing platforms on our website, on the ADC's website, which is designers.ca, or on canadahelps.org. So please consider donating if you can. Thank you for your patience uh, with all of our announcements. It is now uh, my pleasure to welcome back our guest of this event. Uh, Nazir Gaderi is a Toronto-based multimedia artist, educator, and director that works with film interactive multimedia. With the direction of Marina Abramovic, he was the media producer and on-site technical assistant for the 2013 Luminato Festival's My Prototype and has directed his original work, Dissolving Self, for Isaiah, which is held in Dubai. Uh, Maz has also taught media production and conceptual development at Artscape, OCAD University, and Ryerson University, and holds a bachelor's in media studies and a master's in design. Welcome, Maz. Welcome back, I should say. Hi. Hi. How's it going, Andrew? Very, very good. I'm very excited right to have on. you back here for your uh, solo solo presentation. Yeah, happy to be here. I've been looking forward to it all week. Yay, so have we. Uh, so let's just start it off with my, my usual question to our presenters. What have you seen or experienced or been a part of uh, since the start of the pandemic, which has been inspiring to you in your creative work? Um, I've been in a lot of Zoom meetings like everybody else, um, but that has kind of inspired for me and some friends to form a, a little collective that we're calling mm -hmm. a live cinema collective. It's basically, we're interested to kind of use live streaming platforms 
and live switching to basically do a, make a live film and other sessions oh, wow. at level up have talked about that so i think it's i think it's kind of exciting it's like the idea of like the best of both worlds like live performance theater you know mm -hmm. it's like spontaneous like what's going to happen and the best one of the best things about film is that it does live editing i mean i wish i could edit my life you know just edit out all the crappy parts the boring parts <laughs> but so that's it's going to be very experimental so that is something pretty new um there's some other stuff but we're going to talk more about that that i'm going to go over and um yeah so that's definitely been something like looking at taking the best of both worlds and try to just to make the most out of the situation where you know we're in front of computers and software just keep getting better so why don't we make some cool art and tell stories that have to do with that and the, a theme that we our collective wants to explore is like looking at surveillance technology and mm -hmm. looking at kind of like that and also um what does it mean to perceive reality like uh, deep fakes and ai and things mm -hmm. like that so it will be get I, I hope it gets very sci-fi that's my yeah intent. very 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 interesting it's very topical it's everything yeah. that we're dealing with all, all the time. So that's super exciting. Uh, I look forward to seeing that. So oh, Andrew's gone. The uh, robots yeah. probably Sorry. heard him. They, yeah, they, they, probably, they, the robots they, they knocked me out. out. Yeah. <laughs> like, that's all right. Um, that, but yeah, that's uh, there's there's our segue. <laughs> Right. Uh, uh, yeah. yeah. So, what are, what are you going to be? Uh, what are you going to be talking to us about? Yeah, today? I'm kind of. I'm going to kind of walk through uh, the different phases of my life. No, I'm going to kind of walk through what kind of ended up becoming what I've called playformance. Just basically, kind of like my artistic practice. I have different things I do, but um, that's kind of the main thing. And I think I would retain to an audience like this, which is more stage based. So, I'm just going to kind of talk about what led me there what I like about it, what inspired it, what are some ideas that float around in that kind of that space of like interactive tech and live events and stages and cultural movements that are spontaneous. And then I'll talk about what I'm working on now, um, what I've been working on and what's new and what's not as new, but still very current, working towards some fine cuts. So it's basically gonna kind of walk you through uh, how this all started for me and where it's gone. All right. Super yeah. exciting. Well, uh, you have the floor and I'll be back later on. So sounds good. Uh, and, and anybody has questions, you can just, uh, type away and I'll do the best I can to answer them. Okay. So, yeah. So thank you for being here. Um, play formats. Yeah. So we're going to talk about, kind of where it all started for me with ideas that I get and wanting to do cool stuff. Um, so there we go. So that's my screen. So I'll pretty much be sharing my screen like this the entire time. We're going to be watching a lot of videos. I'm going to be talking over it. So basically, one of the things that kind of started out for me really was just traveling. Like, look, I'm so sad. We can't really do that right now. but. Um, yeah like traveling as a form of inspiration um so starting with like just with a point and shoot camera um it was kind of starting out my style of telling stories through video you know this was in iran i was born in iran came as refugees when i was five so i was able to go back in 2010 then i went to dubai nicaragua um and just kind of different places where i would just kind of go and shoot things that I thought were cool and interesting conversations I would have with people. And then I would put something together when I'm back home. Um, so, you know, so it, it kind of, it, the interesting thing about traveling is that like something very simple that's new can inspire a brand new idea, kind of reset you. It's like, we don't get excited about what's in our front lawn. Sometimes we take that stuff for granted. Um, and for me, I'm kind of a xenophile, so I like to always kind of look around, uh, especially in my 20s, where it's a lot of my creative ideas kind of came out of uh, just kind of looking at other people's lawns, um, you know. And 
Yeah, so that's kind of how things started with me in terms of some ideas I had. Um, and then kind of pivoting from that, um, I wanted to kind of show this specific clip. So this is me and my dad. We were in Shiraz, which is a city in southern Iran. And um, this is a really good example of like things that always stick in my memory. Um, basically, what we have here is we got some Shirazi kids playing a guitar that was originally conceived of in Mesopotamia, but perfected by a Spaniard. They're going to be singing a song to an American tune with a rap verse in it. So the hybrid of cultures, and you know, they're they're probably they're probably not even that like they're probably not even thinking about it at that level. They're just doing things that they like. You know, so that says a lot about the kind of stuff that I like to do. I like to mismatch things. And you'll see that as I talk about my projects, but check out this clip. So very, very Persian, always a broken hearted love song. But what I like about that is that, yeah, it just mixes up different styles to create something really cool. Um, that's kind of the, the things I like. We're gonna be talking about the trickster archetype later. And the trickster always kind of lives at the border between worlds. Um, so this kind of helped to formulate something of like my artistic voice. And, you know, I didn't really know it at the time. And this, this was not, none of this was terribly intentional, but looking back on it, I could see certain patterns that I'm sharing with you today. So, you know, I would like, I would, um, so sci-fi elements are there, uh, traveling is there and just kind of like, kind of day in the life sort of stuff. That was a shoot I did for Marina Arbonovich for a kind of like a crazy install she did at Trinity Bellwoods here in Toronto. Um, and then I just kind of got really into blending video and playing with uh, visual effects. Um, and we're gonna watch one short film I did in grad school uh, next. And it's gonna speak a lot to um, kind of my interest in kind of culture and tech. And uh, it's, um, you know, the, the things that we buy say a lot about us. Um, so this is a story about a guy who died that you never meet and his objects are telling him uh, about his life. I did this with some friends, Chris Moore and Jackson McConnell. Uh, it's inspired by Philip K. Dick's book, Ubik. Um, and let's let's watch. Lenny, 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 how did we meet Lenny? It was a few years ago. Uh, it was out over over by Qu Queen Street. Is that right, Lefty? Yeah. I mean, he was thrown out another pair of boots. So, uh, been around a lot, a lot of places, a lot of, a lot of walking, a lot of chafing. I met him a while ago I, I think it was at some nightclub it was in, it was in some bathroom I think he was he was very excited and happy um I haven't seen him in a while let alone like that uh Leonard bought me in Vancouver then when he uh, moved here shipped me in a box it's pretty crappy I'm a single speed bike yeah I know what you're thinking no no I'm not fixed gear it's none of that bullshit. okay um uh -huh. 
Not much to tell. Uh, I'm a frying pan. I cook things. You know, we be walking, going to places, seeing different people, having conversations, getting to adventures. Oh, you might be seeing lots of people. I see okay, a lot of dogs. Don't you start. I'm just saying, he's walking don't all over with, us all the time. We got company. Um, okay, fine. I'm polite. Uh, yeah, Leonard takes a lot of diverse shots with me, you know, beautiful scenery, but from time to time we do see a strange thing here or there, but I'd, I'd, I'd rather not say, actually. I'd like to keep that between us. Uh, what do I do? Jeez. If I could read myself, I, I can't stretch that way, just some instructions, uh, like, back here. Somebody tried to read it to me, but I think they were they were making a joke. I don't quite get it, I, but I haven't done that. I'm kind of having the kind of an, you know, what, how did they say? The notebook told me it's a kind of like an existential crisis. I, I, I'd say Leonard seems like a pretty weird cat because um, he writes some, like between you and me, some weird stuff in me sometimes. Uh, like so much so that like the things that he puts in me makes me not like myself anymore. Favorite time with Lenny? Probably when he goes to bed. Ain't that the ain't that the god awful truth? Ain't that the god awful truth? If you're asking me if he if he cleans me, then uh, well, that's not the type of frying pan I am. You're not supposed to use soap on my type of frying pan. But yeah, Lenny's all right. Sometimes sometimes he comes. All right. When was the last time you was polished? I, I'm I'm trying to, I'm trying to be polite as as a respect as a respect for for the past and the people that I'm with us no more. He asked you a question. Oh, okay, give him an answer. Lenny never cleans himself proper, and so we suffer for that. And that's something that I just have to get off of my off of my laces. He wasn't very good at actually sticking to the rules of applying oil and only oil. Lenny bought me when he was a pretty amateur rider, so out of nowhere comes his truck. So you can guess what happens next. Instead of getting me fixed proper. Decides he goes to get a Canadian tire, patches me up. Garbage. Yeah, so that was a fun little student project I did back in the day at OCAD. I moved to Toronto to go to grad school at OCAD and the Digital Futures Program. Um, and I want to show that because it's, it's going to, uh relate to stuff later on and kind of some of my interests um okay let's go on yeah but you know at the same time i had to kind of do make stuff for people that sell things and kind of make ends meet um but on the other hand i kind of got very quick at photoshop and after effects and premiere and all that stuff really informed my work but you know, I gotta say, you know, like for me at least, to be an artist, I I needed to always have something to kind of ground me, to kind of pay the bills and pay rent. That's why I was able to. That's why I've been able to kind of continue to do art, you know. So that's the stuff I had to do. And then you know, you know kind of jumping around a bit. But this was this was back in Vancouver, which is where I grew up. I wrote I wrote reviews for uh, an Iranian paper in their English section, theater reviews. Because I went and saw Death of a Salesman. This was this was like uh, could have been 2010, 2011 at the Playhouse. Doesn't exist anymore. But I saw Death of a Salesman. And I'm like, this is dope. This is just such an immigrant story. But I didn't really see like it, many kind of first gen Canadians like in the crowd. And I'm like, they should totally be here. They would totally relate to the story. So then that kind of spurred me on to kind of write a review for it. And then I, it's something that I continued to do. I 1984, which I love. They did a stage adaptation at the Colch. Jesus Hop the A Train. That's one I will never forget. So then, like theater, kind of became into it came into my life because the stories, certain stories, were just so memorable. And that's a funny thing about theater, you know. Like with most people, I think like if you watch a crappy film, people are going to continue to watch films. But something with theater is that if somebody watches a crappy play. They may never go to a play again. They're like, ah, plays suck, you know. But for me, I I like the spontaneous feeling of like seeing uh, a show on on a on a stage. So, um, and then the graduate, uh, they did a stage adaptation, and then a guy that's kind of half he's half Iranian actor. So I was like, okay. So I started to connect and kind of get to know the scene and find overlaps with what I'm doing and. 
had a good conversation with that guy. Anyway, I still kind of remember these shows. This is like 10 years ago, but this kind of started out my interest in like stage. And then fast forward to kind of grad school um, at OCAD. And then I started to kind of look at the ways, I started to learn about Arduino. No, I started to learn about projection mapping. I started to learn about connect and motion capture and stuff like that. And I was like, okay, this is really cool. I want to um, look at how I can incorporate that to things that are happening in real time, to stuff that's happening on stage. So I did it with a whirling dervish and I'll go into some of these projects. I did it with storytellers using a, a leap motion hand gesture um, for their hand motion, um, a poet. Um, and this is kind of like the bulk of what we're, we're going to be talking about. I did it with a DJ, like a DJ would be um, kind of moving his hands in 3D space, like forward, backward, up, down, side to side. And those would be mapped to uh, different effects that a, a DJ would use, like reverb or or uh, any other kind of effects that he was doing. It was a tractor at the time. We were using Gecko MIDI to make sending MIDI messages from uh, motion array, um, motion array, it's from leap motion over to tractor. And that was super fun. But then what's funny, what's really funny about that and that learn, like learning about performers when they know, when they can change media in real time, they tend to like it too much. You know, like he, so the DJ who does a lot of like reggae, that DJ there was doing a lot of reggae and dance hall. He ended up turning into more of like a soundscape artist because he kind of liked the feeling of doing it and the sounds he would hear. So it turned very abstract. Um, so it completely changed the output for better or for worse. Um, and then, yeah, so it was my major research project at OCAD, uh, Playformance. I, my supervisors, like they told me I got to narrow in. So I focused it on hand gestures when I was really just more interested in the whole body. Um, and I was looking at hand gestures, like the different types of hand gestures and what they mean. Um, and, and then here are some kind of behind the scenes or messing around with audio mulch at the time and blending kind of a live feed and putting a filter over it and then projecting that back on stage behind performers or in front of them, uh, playing with an Arduino Fio and a gyroscope. I found the gyroscope to be kind of like the best uh, wearable tech sensor to get really good uh, movement um, from performers in the torso. And then a Microsoft Connect was good for kind of like absolute values. So I'll show you what I mean. Uh, when we start talking about dissolving self, one of my projects, um, so yeah, it's like here's a kind of example of like a creative process that helped me to guide this new type of show. For me, it was new at at least to kind of blend live performance and interactive tech at the same time. First step was inspiration. You know, like I said before, kind of like looking around, looking at your own culture, looking at your friends' cultures, and just seeing kind of like what's out there. Um, seeing what inspires you. And the thing that I realized what's really good about this type, what works better than not for shows like this is movements that are spontaneous, you know, like, because you always have to ask yourself, what's the point of making it interactive? Like it's so much more work and it's so much more risky. And the reason, the answer to that, that I found that was uh, good enough for me is movements that are spontaneous. So like whirling dervish or like capoeira or like the way hands move during like spoken word or a poem. So those were the kind of things that I would like look for. And it was like trial and error, like figuring out um, the type of performances that would work for this. Then conceptual development, like thinking about, well, what's the idea? Like what's basically the story? Like what are people seeing on stage? Uh, what's the beginning, middle and end? Um, what is the payoff? Like by the by the end of the show, you want the audience to be like, okay, I received the payoff. Like there's something that we achieved by watching this performer on stage. So that's something like a story arc. And then the technology comes in, it's kind of like looking at how you can use the tech to enhance the movements of a performer. And like one thing that I learned is that it's like the 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 virtual, the screen, or the soundscape that's being affected by the body. A metaphor that I like to use is kind of like, the screen is kind of like a portal 
into what the performance artist can, um, what the performance artist is trying to say, but the body cannot. So it's like the inner monologue that people can kind of decipher to kind of make their own meaning out of like what's happening on stage. Cause all this stuff is pretty abstract. I mean, it's like basically a lot of it's like in the realm of like contemporary dance. Sometimes I had voiceovers, most of the times I didn't. And there's a way to kind of push the story forward. And I found that when the, when the graphics are moving with the body, it kind of creates two performers that are kind of dancing together, moving together. And if you give enough of a structure of like a beginning, middle and end, it's enough for people to kind of form their own interpretation and get a sense of payoff. Then yeah, artist interpretation. So it'd be the director, usually that was me. And basically taking at the idea and the tech and what do I want to do with this? And then the design element came, came in because you're working with technology, um, prototyping, essentially. There was a trinity of kind of like prototyping, set design, uh, rehearsals, and over and over again until you're happy with it. Then you have the event. It's always good to have a deadline, right? You need something to work towards. So you can, you can wrap yourself around in that trinity over and over again. But eventually you need to do the show. And you know, the stuff, it doesn't need to be perfect because it has an abstract quality to it anyways. Um, it just needs to be kind of good enough. And that's one thing that I've realized. It's kind of like a philosophy, philosophy of mine is the idea of GE, good enough. Get it to a place where it pushes a conversation forward. And the next time you do it, if you do, push the ball a little bit further every time. Documentation, very important for getting grants and to reflect back on it and just sharing it and disseminating it on YouTube or wherever you want to put it up and then reflecting on it. And then if you do do, do it again, maybe take it the next step, right? There's always something you could do better, um, whether with the, with the idea or the tech or the hybrid of the both. So that's kind of like a creative process for these play format shows that I thought was useful for me. And then, yeah, so this kind of Venn diagram is kind of like three things. Funny, you know, things usually come in threes, I found. Um, so performance art, uh, the performer, a poet, a storyteller. And then on the right, you got kind of the tech. An XB is a radio module. That's what sends the information from the sensor over to the computer with the help of the Arduino. Um, Leap motion is the motion capture, hand gesture one. Um, and then creative direction. It's like you need you need you need some, a sense of direction. Like where is this all going? Um, what's the story here? I'm more of a story guy than I am more abstract. Um, I like things that I feel I've accomplished something by the time it's finished. It doesn't have to be a happy ending. It's just a sense of um, an arc, basically. And uh, you put those two together. Um, you put those three together and you have a play form and show, which some people call a network performance because different elements are talking to each other through uh, radio or wires. And, um, yeah, so that's kind of the uh, anatomy of a show. And uh, it'd be a good time to kind of pause here and kind of look at some inspirations, you know, like. I started to feel like I'm kind of forming a language with what I'm doing. And I knew I was on the right track because it was connecting to things I already liked, um, like Black Mirror, Matrix, Space Odyssey, you know, and this was all kind of by accident. Um, and a big element in my work is um, religion. That's weird for me to say, because I've, I've never really, I never grew up with religion, but I kind of feel like we live in like a post-secular society where we live in such an irreligious place, a headspace, that we're looking for meaning through the things that we interact with, through the internet, through um, activist culture, through film, through drugs, through traveling, through identity. We're trying to form these like kind of mimetic tribes of like, where do I belong? And um, so. So I've been looking at kind of like the overlap with that is like religion, spirituality, magic. Um, so like technology is kind of like a congealed kind of imagination. Um, it's like M McKenna, the big magic mushroom guy, he talks about how computers are drugs and drugs are computers. Um, it kind of reconfigures our whole psyche 
and it reflects our world back to us in worlds we in ways we couldn't imagine. Like we live in completely different worlds in terms of media. Where do you get your news? What shows do you watch? What shows you don't watch? Um, Neil's pill, right? It's the most heroic part in the Matrix. Um, the pill is a technology that mediates what is fact and fiction. Um, so kind of looking at existential, uh, like the boot before, existential kind of conversations and questions and the the reality, the real, the perception of reality, basically. And I just love the way wearable tech, for example, or kind of live graphics and projection mapping and the cool things you could do in tech in real time, like in a live space, can make people feel like that if only for a moment. I love when they're they can't figure out how it works, but the story's so good that they they stop thinking about that and they just kind of like they just have them in your hand when it just feels like magic. You know, um, so let's look at one of my shows. So this was Dissolving Self, uh, Sufi Whirlings for people that aren't familiar. So Sufism is the mystic side of Islam and Sufi Whirling is this kind of physical meditation that some Sufis do where they whirl and it's it's kind of like an ode. It's a, it's a, it's a way to be closer to the divine. It's um, it's ineffable. It's a very individual experience. Uh, I experienced it when I went to Istanbul in a Sufi circle and just the vibe of it. It's just very, um, feels very alive. And that type of movement, I want to kind of augment tech onto it to kind of create a metaphor for the divine. It's really a lot of it's inspired by um, Rumi's poetry. Rumi says that the lover walks, the lover wakes and whirls in a dancing joy and then kneels down and prays. That's Coleman Barks. Uh, he was a big uh, translator of Rumi stuff. So, you know, he talks a lot about that. He talks about the divine in terms of the cosmos. So let's watch a bit of this. I want to start at the beginning here. Let me just mute it. So what's happening here is that we have a Microsoft Connect that's getting absolute values left and right. Uh, so when the performer goes left and right, the sphere follows her. And then she's also wearing a gyroscope. Um, she's also wearing a gyroscope and she that means that the faster she whirls, the bigger the sphere gets. So let's watch a bit of this. So she's got the gyroscope on the small of her back. And, and I should mention that as her body moves left and right, the sphere follows her. And it was all kind of pretty nerve wracking, right? Like, cause it could screw up at any moment. And it has, and it does. And it did, I redid the show in Dubai and it totally flaked out. Uh, we made the software, uh, we made the graphics. Uh, my partner, Mac uh, Ryan Maximik made the uh, graphics and processing. Um, but if we were to do it again, we'd probably switch over to Touch Designer. This is back in 2013. So basically it's following her. So this is a cool part in the show. Okay, so now mind you, we haven't turned on the gyroscope. So with this live data stuff, I felt it useful to kind of create a, um, to kind of create structure. Because if we left the gyroscope on, it would kind of oscillate and jitter the whole time and we didn't want that. So that's the importance of kind of like structure and kind of building something that feels like a story, even though it's never explicitly said. Now, when, this, when the sphere gets a bit bigger, then we turn the um, gyroscope on. 
I'll tell you exactly when. There, now it's on. Yeah, so as you can see, like sometimes it kind of jitters. So that was when we redid this in Dubai, we actually put EL wire on her skirt. And when um, she would she would whirl at a certain speed or faster, the EL wire would uh, light up. And then we fixed the jitteriness of the sphere uh, and we made it more like a ball of particles. Uh, and you could see that all on my site. Um, so it's always good to kind of look back and enhance and kind of take a take graphics to the next level when you can. Um, so yeah, so that was the first time. This is when I was a student at OCAD, and this is the first time we ever did a show uh, that had to do with uh, a live event and sensors. We got a question here: Does what is body storming? Uh, Body storming for me when I've used it, uh, it's just kind of like being in the space, like looking at, um, because when you're when you're working with kind of movements, it's useful to um, to kind of have the performer move in the space, turn the sensor on, and see what it does and what it doesn't do. And you need a kind of like an inventory of the kind of numbers you're going to get from certain movements. Um, so it's like brainstorming, but with the body, like using your body to um, get more information and research and experiment. Um, and it helps you get closer to kind of like a, a fine cut, the step before the final cut. Fast forward, this is another show I did. Um, so basically the log line of this, I talked like a filmmaker. Uh, so the log line of this is, Marvin, Diana, Michael, and Smokey have been trapped in computers for centuries. Through their host's foreign fresh, fle fleshy vocal cords, these ghosts sing a series of love, of love songs as relics odes to the golden era of Motown. So basically this was for Subtle Technologies Festival at the Gladstone Hotel here in Toronto about five years ago. And it was an opener for a fashion show kind of like this post-human crazy fashion show and we put a Motown singer on a ladder. We put a dress over the ladder and we use that as a projection service. And take a look. It never can say goodbye. Even though the pain and the heartache seems to follow me wherever I go, oh, I try to hide my feelings. They always seem to show. Tell me why is it so? So something that I had to kind of learn through the process is the importance of documentation and having time in the room before, like the lighting, um, it, the lighting was tricky because there wasn't a lighting rig where this was and it was an opener for another show. And so it made it, it you can't see the performer's face that well. So we put a light behind her to kind of give a backlight on the um, um, Brooks. So the graphic in the middle reacts to the volume of her voice. And then these little rings are being created. Um, I'm just pressing a button in the back. So there's certain times where it's a manual input uh, and certain times where it's complete interactive. So it gives it a sense of control, you know. Um, other parts of it. 
Everybody's interested in learning. Look at the teacher. Segregation, determination, demonstration, indignation, aggravation, humiliation, obligation to our nation, follow confusion. That's what the world is today. So there was a live uh, keyboardist and a uh, violinist to the side, and I, I I really love this project because it was it was a blend of Motown, which I love, but it was totally like ghostly because it's kind of like the idea is that it's called Detroit 2311. It's like in the future when cybernetic implants are prominent. So this girl falls asleep in front of the computer, like Neo and kind of the souls of the Motown legends kind of like I talk to her through the internet and kind of possess her. So it's like very ghostly. That's Kimai Hippolyte. She's so good. We had to hire her to sing at our wedding. Uh, she's dope. Um, but yeah, so that kind of speaks to, I'm kind of getting closer to kind of like what I'm into, you know, kind of like sci-fi, cultural, in this case, Black American culture, tech, sci-fi, crazy graphics, ghostly, you know. All right, so that was Detroit. It was a nice one. I just remember that one. So then I had the gear already built. So I was like, okay, why don't I do something for my mom? So it was like for, this was at um, Buddies in Bad Times Theater, uh, Rhubarb Festival 2019. This was like for Valentine's Day. So we did Shabbat Ishk, uh, Night of Love. And my mom flew in from Vancouver. And uh, there's a little intro that I, I'm gonna play now where I say a few words. So, consider the next 30 minutes of fantasy, depictions, impressions, interpretations of the memory. For our memories aren't reproductive, they're reconstructive. Nostalgia of a time that once was, and that we can only hope and dream will return us to it once again. Women aren't allowed to sing in public in Iran. So we brought Iran to you. On this Valentine's Day weekend, we bring you Shale Ish, which is Persian for Night of Love. So I just wanted to play that just to say, kind of like, it's a bit of my interest there, kind of like the. Um, kind of like uh, looking at the past. So basically the, the premise of this is like Persian pop songs, but like pre-revolution. So like when uh, pre-Islamic revolution, so it was, Iran was a bit more free in terms of cultural things. So this is like when my mom was uh, like in her 20s, this is the kind of music she would listen to. So I took that and then worked with some musicians, uh, Iranian musicians to kind of do different renditions of songs and then we took pop music videos from the 70s of like a famous singer, Gugush, and we mapped it to the dress and then her voice as she sings, as the louder she sings, it would create a bad TV effect. So check it out. Thank you. 
So of course, Persian music again, super, super tr dramatic about love. Where are you? Why did you leave me? All that. Um, yeah, but it was, I think it was the first time I did something of my own kind of background. I came to Canada when I was five, pretty much a westernized kid. You know, I speak, I lived in Brazil, I taught English down there and I speak Portuguese better than uh, Farsi. Even my Spanish is a little bit of that better than Farsi. But anyway, so I've been using kind of like my artistic practice to kind of go into that and explore that and work with Iranian and Canadian musicians. They kind of just learn, you know? So it's funny, like I'm kind of always like this tourist, you know? But I like that. I like kind of like floating around at the border of different worlds and looking at, because I didn't want to just do a traditional show. I wanted to do that, but with augmentation of some cool graphics and some funky stuff that's like different. And make I told them like make the renditions different, make them um, a bit more somber. Um, you know, so that was that was a fun one. It's always good to get more mileage out of the gear you make for installations. Yeah, well, that was Shabishk. Okay, yeah, so fast forward to uh, Summer Works. This was a few years ago. So another idea I had was I always wanted to do something. I went and saw Tanya Tagak at the Aga Khan Museum like, maybe like four years ago. And it was like very like moving, you know, like very, when I would hear the Inuit throat singing, it was like, Rrr, like very visceral. I'm like, okay, this is interesting. And then I just kind of started learning about contact mics. It's just kind of like the mi microphone is basically a measurement of vibration. So then I met up with Kathleen Merritt, who's an Inuit throat singer. She sometimes just comes to Toronto for shows. Then we became friends and we started talking and, uh, went to one of her shows at Etobicoke and then she would do throat singing and then I asked and then she said put your hand on my back and then when she would make the kind of when she would do the throat singing the vibrations were so visceral and I'm like right there that would be perfect to use as an input to make um kind of graphics change so fast forward, we applied for a grant and uh, ended up working with the Scylla Singers out of Edmonton and St. Field here in Toronto to do the live score. Uh, and we basically kind of created a, uh, a digital tundra. Um, and Sahar Homami, who did the uh, touch designer work, and we made Katimayuit. Katimayuit uh, means people meeting and Naktatuk. And let me talk a bit about this project as we play it. So, so the first thing. I've learned that you gotta kind of do with shows like this is you have to convince the audience that something is interactive. If this happens and this happens, easiest way to do that is with opacity. So you got a graphic and we, the first graphic we wanted to kind of take them into this world. So we did these graphics that were kind of supposed to be like a throat, like a tunnel, so like come into this world and uh, we're hearing kind of like the the Arctic winds there, and you're coming into this world, and there's going to be a drum sound. So starting with percussion is uh, something we wanted to do. So we make it very obvious. We want to convince you that yes, this is uh, interactive, and um, yeah. So we mapped it with opacity. I, 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 I. Ay 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 
Yeah, sorry, I'd forgotten how it started. Uh, the singing first, then the drumming. But yeah, like that's, it's such a great intro, you know, uh, Malaya Bishop and uh, Jenna Broomfield. Yeah, they were great to work with. Um, so then, yeah, the percussion. So it's like, we wanna convince you that there is interactivity here. So you, you understand that, and then we can zoom out and kind of tell you the story. So the story of this was basically two Inuit women, but from different parts that have different customs and rituals, and they meet at the border of their kind of territories. Uh, because if I remember correctly, Jenna is more closer to the tree line and Malaya, she's from like much more North, uh, but they both live in Edmonton now. But you know, that also shows that there's a lot of diversity within kind of indigenous communities themselves, of course. So this is great. There's like a lot of learning that I had here. And so, yeah, so basically the idea was that they meet and they see each other on the plane, right? So this was really cool because this is something that I learned about like this, like how wrestling is uh, part of kind of Inuit culture. So they, they put that into the show and it was a perfect touch because that was kind of like when they start to interact, these two characters meeting for the first time. Uh, and, you know, we're kind of playing with imagery of the tundra and kind of like broken glass. When you look at like Inuit, like tattoos and illustrations, it's a lot of fine lines. So you wanted to kind of like, echo that in the graphics. <laughs> And a bit of chaos before the um, scene of unity. So, and again, yeah, opacity is the most obvious thing, right? <laughs> So in terms of the graphics, we were looking at kind of river, river and northern lights. Thank <laughs> you. 
So that's kind of, that's the first time, we turn that down. That's the first time color, we see color. So we want to kind of give a climax to that. And that's the two women kind of coming together and singing together. And that was Kata Mayuit, people meeting, people meeting. Uh, yes, we did it for SummerWorks 2017 or 18. Yeah, that was a fun one. So once again, like spontaneous uh, sort of sounds, movements, works really well for these types of shows, I found. Moving forward, the first time I did summer works with, was, was for a capoeira show. So I used to live in Brazil, I speak Portuguese pretty well, and capoeira is just something I kind of dabbled with. And because it's spontaneous as well, I was like, okay, this would be a great fit for um, kind of wearable tech. So, but instead of visuals being the thing that's changed from the live movement, we made it sounds. So first I'm going to play a little trailer of a trickster character issue. So our choreographer, Nuta Morales, he's a Yurumba practitioner and we we're kind of learning a lot about that faith and kind of the different Orishas. So each of the four characters were an Orisha and this was the, um, this was the, uh, issue character and i the tech lead on this with steven Surin, so he made this 3d printed mask and here's the kind of promo that we did for the trickster character which is issue i have the moment before you the second before you awake i need a day or a night but the fleeted miss just beyond reach. I test, I tease, I play. I'm your neighbor's playground and tell me more. I dance at the rhythm of the sun. A mosquito that tickles you know. Life into yeah, so that was a fun little project. So before I show you this, so basically the idea was that Kappa Wada happens in the Hoda, which is basically a circle. So we did this at Shaw Park in Toronto by Ossington and Queen West. And we basically had the audience kind of sit around a circle and the show happened in the round. And everybody in the audience have, has headphones and they're all hearing the same thing. And uh, two or, yeah, one of them, the, the protagonist, the bald guy, Nathan. So he's wearing the gyroscope and that is what that is kind of like the essence and that's taken by the trickster character uh and the gyroscope is kind of what is going to you're going to hear this you're going to watch this short clip and it's going to be what affects the sound of rain that happens le in left and right and the reverb on it i think um for the audience <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
So in this instance, we use the wearable tech right as a story piece, you know, and it was what represents the essence that's taken from the protagonist by the trickster. So that's a fun project. This is, yeah, the first time I did summer work. So it was the first time kind of working with sound output, which is so much easier to work with than video output, just because of the lag and the, the amount of information that you need to send. This was done in Max MSP. Okay, ooh, it's all about the hour mark. So let me kind of speed up here. Uh, here's another project I worked on. It was, wasn't my project, but this is somebody else's. This is for Harbor Front Center. If I won't listen to you and you won't listen to me, we should we, we should listen to them. <laughs> you, you know what? I, I like those odds. I mean, come on. I mean, this will probably be the last chance in a generation that we'll ever be able to travel faster than the speed of light. Go and so basically, so I was the show switcher. So I was making all these assets in Isadora and we have, uh, it was a one man show and he has a face rig and that is mapped to his talking head. Uh, and this kind of started me thinking on, this was for um, uh, uh, Pascal Langard as uh, the actor there. This is for uh, Hatch at Harbor Front in 2014. Um, and there's some live interactivity where people can tweet and kind of change the story. Um, and then it kind of, kind of brought me back to something I love is like sci-fi as a muse. Um, and I love kind of like the way holog holograms look. I love the way that they did them in Blade Runner 2. Um, kind of the imperfection of it where you can kind of see through it. And then I thought, okay, well, can I make that? So I looked at the Tupac hologram. Um, and I was like, okay, so I, I looked at this and I basically what I did was, it was really a Pepper's ghost effect. And I, which is kind of what this basically is, you're looking at something at an angle. Um, I'll show you what I mean. So I was basically used it for my thesis installation where I, I won't go into this too, too much, but basically it was four wooden objects with a sensor in them and each one affects the way a fire looks. And then this holographic fire in the center were made in processing, basically a particle emitter. And uh, there's a percussion accelerometer. And the idea the story was that there's a ghost trapped in each object and that affects the fire and everybody sees the fire and you could accumulate, they change what happens with the fire. I want to show you just this image here to kind of show you how it how I did that. This is something I definitely want to do again. So it's basically four screens on their backs, an upside down pyramid with the top cut off, and acrylic uh, panels. So when you look at it, you're seeing the reflection of the screen, so you can see through it. There's just something about that effect that creates the illusion of depth, and it was really fun to do. People got a kick out of it. Um, and then we did it again for Nuit Blanche. First time I did Nuit Blanche, so we upgraded the um, fire from processing over to Unity. So we had the Arduino sensors come in and talk with OSC and affect uh, wind elements in a Unity environment to change the fire quality, make, make it bigger, make it smaller, make it go left and right. And that was really fun. And that's Duke Redbird, the indigenous storyteller telling stories. He lasted at like 3 a.m. that night. This was at the Hilton in 2015, I want to say. Um, yeah, this was really fun. And this is definitely something I want to do again. But yeah, there's this idea of the fire, kind of the first technology kind of brought people together. Um, and, and yeah, it's just something about reflections of light that create the illusion of depth that makes it feel like a hologram. And people had so many questions about that. They wondered how it worked. Do I see a different fire than the person next to me? Because everybody had, everybody's facing a panel and there's four people at once. And because the, the I'm hiding all the tech, I'm hiding all the wires, the, the, it's in, the sensors are in wood with the battery in it and you can't see anything else. So you're just curious about what it's working, or how it's working. So it's again, it's this idea of technology is magic. And I just love the idea of like, what if I had these instruments and I could change the way the fire looked? And then there it was. Yeah, and Unity, I mean, it really just took it next level as opposed to just a simple particle emitter in processing. It made it really pretty. Fast forward to 
uh, third time at the Nuit Blanche. So there's this tradition in kind of like the countryside in Iran before there was heating in houses, there would be this, um, well, I'll let you, I'll let you say They'll be keeping warm, whatever the weather, but also part This was a CBC interview I did. By Toronto artist, Maziar Gaderi. It's called Corsi, and Maziar is here. So describe a bit more about what I'm going to see in front of the Gardner Museum tomorrow night. Yeah, thank you for having me. Uh, so basically, a corsi is a traditional Iranian low table. Back in the day where there wasn't heating in houses, what families would used to do is that they would have this low table, have floor pillows all around it, and they would put coal fire under the table and a big blanket over the table that would kind of drape over people's laps. And it was just a very kind of practical, kind of rural way of staying warm at the onset of winter. What we did is basically you're remediating that traditional pastime of, you know, my grandparents uh, and my father's childhood. This project is a, it's a dedication to my father because when he was a kid, this is what his family would used to do. So yeah, this is a documentary I'm working on about the installation. So there's a whole story behind that. My dad coming in from Vancouver for the show. And yeah, so this is kind of what it looked like in the end. You're on your low table. I see some of you already see that you take the blanket, you put it over your laps, and there's heaters under the table to keep you warm. The reason these pomegranates are here is because in our culture, in Iranian culture, it represents uh, love and fertility, and they're harvest this time of year. Uh, this is a dedication to my dad right there, that Hossein in the corner, wearing the hat. There he is. There he goes. Yay! Oh, Hossein. Oh, Hossein. Yeah. Yeah, so basically had live musicians kind of from different cultures playing music by the Corsi and had electric heaters under the Corsi. And it was really fun. And it was just kind of like another attempt to kind of recreate. So there's a theme here, right? It's kind of like I'm trying to recreate memories that really aren't my own, but I'm doing it through my lens. Um, and that's what remediation is. Like it's, it's, it can never be really traditional because I don't come from that tradition. I'm coming and seeing it through my lens. But I think that's what's interesting. It's like kind of like living at the border of different worlds. Um, and my dad got a kick out of it. So that that's good. Uh, yeah, so this is a documentary. This is a scene from it. Um, just kind of talking about how, why we came over to Canada as refugees during the war. Um, I will play this maybe for another time in the interest of time. And then it kind of started up my interest in kind of like, there's this new project I'm working on called, called Pakistan. So Pakistan in Persian cosmology. So Pakistan is the home of the Peris, AKA fairies. That's where the word fairy uh, comes from. Uh, there's an interchange of kind of F and P because when Iran was colonized by Arabs, they, uh, they don't have P in their language. So the name or like of our language is Farsi. And the fairy was once the peri. So a lot of Western, the Western world experiences like um, Persian culture through that kind of colonial lens. So uh, basically the, the, the peri is the, um, they were fallen angels that need to kind of atone. And they're kind of like a trickster character too, in a way. They're kind of these beautiful characters that kind of help or trick humans. And, uh, and Pakistan is where they're from. And it's, Pakistan is kind of like a, a mythical kind of like unknown world. And, and they, they looked at it a lot at the Caucasus Mountains in the north, a place that they've never been to, like the Persians. And um, so it's like this mysterious mountain mystery, and the, uh, mystery mountain. And they would say, that's where the petties are. So I was like, I like this idea um, and kind of blending it in. So I'm trying to kind of blend in like Zoroastrian, which is like the first monotheistic religion, blending it in with sci-fi. And it's starting out a new project. So I'm working kind of like a sci-fi art house short. I can show you a little bit of it. I pretty much finished it now, but I want to submit it to TIFF, so hopefully I get in. Um, and these are, we shot it in Dubai. Um, so that's a perfect place to do it because it's kind of very techy and futuristic but the desert offers a lot of kind of ancestral um, imagery. You know, these are shots from 
to buy. So this is a kind of a new project. I can show you a little bit here. پسرم عزیز دلم کجا میری؟ So basically kind of like the synopsis of this is that caught between surreal ancestral visions guided by the divine mother fire. So that's a kind of like a, a, a reference to Zoroastrianism, which is a lot of symbology comes from the sacred fire. And in Persian New Year, we kind of jump over the fire. Um, that's part of our traditions. And so it's, it's he, this, this protagonist here is having these visions of this mother that he's never met. And his reality is that he lives like in this Orwellian world where thoughts are controlled. And so he wonders, you know, what is there more out there? So he's trying to find himself through all of this. And so just some shots of the city, you know, but this should be coming out soon. Hopefully I can get a good premiere out of that. But it's going to be part of a longer kind of project where I want to maybe do a uh, three short films on it. Still figuring that out. So that's kind of some current stuff I'm working on. Uh, let me speed up here. Uh, I'll skip this one. It's kind of like a comedy I'm working on. Insulation, new install idea. It's basically the scrim box that I want to do. It's like a projection mapping kind of like where you can see through the box. Um, it's supposed to be for Nuit Blanche. Hopefully they don't cancel again. Um, and yeah, so basically what I want to do here, like one idea is, is that inside the box, you have somebody uh, in a hospital by themselves, but their family can't go and see them and they're FaceTiming with their family. And that video of the FaceTime is projected on the box. So it's be kind of like a theatrical show. And it's kind of perfect for social distancing because it's like in a box and people have to be kind of away from it a bit to see the projection well. So it's something I want to develop. Uh, I already got the grant for it. I just kind of need to find different homes for it. Khune means home in Persian. Another thing, formed a collective uh, with some photo-based media artists. So we want to kind of look at AI technology and how kind of like deep fakes can change expressions. And stories that friends would tell me is that they would be walking down the street and some guys like saying to them, hey, why don't you smile more? You know, that's kind of like this annoying thing that you hear. And my wife, this happens to my wife too. So I was like, okay, so started to have this idea where what if we um, kind of ha have these vacant faces of us and in AI, we put kind of like these uncanny valley kind of like smiles. And it's actually pretty robust. It looks pretty real, but I kind of want to take it in a, like a, I want to kind of distort it and, take it next level and kind of social commentary on that. So that's another project we're working on. Um, and then live cinema collective. So back as uh, the first thing I talked about in this talk, um, I'm going to show you this. So this was in 2015 for Luminato. Blast Theory was here. I was part of the production team. So it was basically a film that was screened and shot at the same time all throughout uh, Toronto. Uh, this is the entire team, you know, one person just to keep it in focus. We're making a documentary out of that. It's the wife there. Um, Here, there's a lot of focus. Have you ever seen the NASA control room for space flights with rows of technicians and engineers at desks in front of a huge screen? Yeah, well, it's nothing like that, but maybe a bit. There's a team of people making the final checks and tests because once we start, 
there's no going back. I came to Toronto in 1978. I was a farm girl from Saskatchewan. I rented a little room in a rooming house. I remember painting a horizon line all around my room. I really miss the space and the emptiness of the prairies. Tonight, I want you to meet some people who changed my life without even knowing it. I spoke to them all one day, nearly four years ago. And as I sit here tonight, thinking about each of these people, I wonder what they're thinking about and what they would have to say to me. And now that you're here, maybe you will have something to say too. This is Gia. So this was kind of like a really awesome project. So basically a child is born at Toronto General and then the story passes on from one character to another where they kind of casually interact and the camera is on a rig and we it's all in one shot. So it goes all the way to Cherry Beach um, through these six characters, I think it was. And so that kind of inspired this kind of like cinema, new live cinema collective that I want to do. Um, we actually got shortlisted for an interview, knock on wood, for the RBC Canadian Stage Residency. That's actually talking with them Friday, so fingers crossed. Uh, but either way, we'll probably wait a grant for it. So that's another thing I'm working on. Uh, and that is pretty much my last. So that's the end um, of my deck. Wow, I really went over hour and 20. Damn. Andrew, you there? Hey, I'm back. Hey. <laughs> That's great. No, that um, you you saved me asking you the question of what are you working on next? That's always a question that I ask. So that's uh, that's great. You're you're a very busy person. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And 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 two things I'm reading right now. So women who run with wolves. This is mm -hmm. a really cool book, very Jungian. I've been really enjoying this about the wild woman archetype. Um, and another Murakami, this is another awesome book that's helping me kind of like help describe the night. I feel like the night is a big part of my work. So there's some awesome books I'm reading right now that I would highly recommend. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Nice. Well, uh, yeah, we got we've got ten minutes left. So if anybody has any questions, now's the time to get them in. Uh, but in the meantime, um, let's just jump back into the tech because that's a very obviously a very important part of what we're talking about these days. Um, but you tell me what, as far as you've 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 worked with like a lot of different uh, pieces of technology throughout your career, uh, you seem to jump from different pieces of technology relatively simply as opposed to sticking with one particular piece. But can you say what has been the most successful and what has been the least successful as far as the tools that you have played with? I would say in terms of kind of performance and stage work, um, the thing that I've used almost every show is Isadora. Um, it's because it's a live, um, it, it's, it's great for sequences like scenes this happens, then this happens. If this happens, make that happen. Fade this, fade that out. And it has the mapping right in there, which is pretty good. Um, so that's been the main kind of video switcher controller. And advice would be convert all of your videos to HAP, uh, hmm. GPU accelerated codec, don't use H.264. Um, the files, when you use HAP, the files are a lot bigger and most softwares can't open it, but I'm telling you, you can play like 20 videos at once and mm -hmm. Isadora won't crash. But if you do that with like three or four H.264 videos, don't even try to do it. Your frame rates oh, yeah. will get dropped. So it's all about GPU accelerated codecs. So that's would be my tip when working with Isadora for anything live. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Yeah. I would second that. I said, I said, oh yeah, the captions thought I said, hell yeah, but that was actually my thinking. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hap, Hap, is, Hap is the best and almost every program that I've ever used runs it and it runs like, yeah, real nice. And you can go backwards, yeah. forwards, jump around the video with no, oh, no yeah. problems. Yeah. yeah. 
and right. and uh, Adobe doesn't support it anymore, I think. So there's, no, they don't. You have you can't, a, they can't yeah. render it out. Yeah, that's that's definitely right. something I've been finding. Yeah, you have to. Right, but but there's a free for Mac only. There's a I forget the name. There's a some acronym thing. But anyway, you can look it up, and that will convert any video for you. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But I don't know the equivalent for PC yet. Yeah, I think I think with most of the Adobe programs, like After Effects and uh, Premiere won't do it natively, but the media encoder still does. There's like an extra thing that you can download and you can still oh. use it in the media encoder. So, okay, cool. Yeah, so no. yeah, I need to find, remember where that was that I found that, but it's, it's real great. Um, and you use a lot of gyroscopes, but is there a particular type of one? Because that's not something that I've ever personally used. So I'm more, I'm, I imagine there's a lot of people that have never actually worked with a gyroscope. So not, not really. I, I think, I think it's just the standard sensor um, okay. that we've used, but we've always used most of the time we use an Arduino Fio and that's just a smaller mm -hmm. Arduino that um, can go on the body. And we found the best place to put a sensor a small of the back is pretty good because mm -hmm. it moves, but not, you want movement, but you don't want a bunch of crazy movement where you're going to get data that's hard for you to index or sift mm -hmm. through. So the small of the back is a good place to put a sensor when working with wearable tech. Uh, wrists are also good if there's like hand gestures. Accelerometers, you'd think they would be good and they can be. I just haven't just found them to be like, cause accelerometers is more kind of like the change in speed. So like, if you're going like this, that's not really any information because it's like a constant speed. But if you're going mm -hmm. like that, then it's better. Right. But a gyroscope gets you rotational and we just found it to be more useful for the type of numbers that you're gonna get and then taking those numbers and mapping them to sound or media graphics. You know, that's just been our experience. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, and so you've also used um, Leap Motion, I guess, was another one that you've mentioned. Yeah, Leap Motion we use when you're trying to just kind of get movements in a small space just for a hand. Mm -hmm. It is stationary, and the hand has to go to it. But if there's something that's happening here and the hands are living there, it's it's more it's not as natural because it's it's more like an instrument you play. It's like a theremin, yeah. you know, like this kind of thing. Um, but it, it, it works well for the DJ. It works well for poets where they uh, can have maybe like a podium. And then that's part of the experience where they're kind of using their body to express themselves. And, yeah. and what's good about Leap Motion is that the, there's hardly any leg. I mean, it's not bad, you know, because it's such a small area. And you're working with their softwares that they have natively, or at least I did. And it's MIDI. And MIDI is usually pretty... Pretty easy to work with. Mm -hmm. uh, MIDI, MIDI, yeah. MIDI's, a, MIDI's a friend. Yeah, yeah. I've had to work uh, quite a bit with OSC, and you find that it also generally pretty, works pretty well, but the coding that goes into it seems to be much more complex, and MIDI goes like much faster. So, yeah. Yeah. The times where I've been able to use MIDI, I have, so I was lucky with that. But yeah, OSC was used for the Capoeira show and probably some other ones. Um, yeah. Oh, and Siphon. Mm -hmm. We use Siphon to bring in like a processing sketch to Isadora. So if you have a processing sketch of some live interactive graphics, the Motown show, we use Siphon to bring it right in and it would just send the frames over to Isadora. So then you can do the mapping on the gown in Isadora. So that's a way that those two talk to each other. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It seems like a, like a lot of your work is based in finding the tools that are right for the job and then compiling them all together, like finding ways to make connections. Uh, it seems yeah. like there's a lot of little pieces that you, um, so DIY kind of feels. Totally, you know, and it's, it's good to kind of like have a good team, like ha have somebody on your team where they can just kind of focus on the tech, have somebody on your team that's kind of like overall, like my role is usually like grant writer, overall direction in terms of like, what is the feeling and story of it all? Sometimes I'm the so uh, Isadora technician on the, during the show. And part of my job would be to kind of interact with the performers because sometimes the tech guy doesn't really want to do that. Mm -hmm. But also the way I work with these cultural shows um, is that I give a lot of space for the performers to kind of um, 
interpret, I kind of try to create a container and say, okay, this amount of space kind of make it feel like this, this amount of space, make it feel like that. And then they can do whatever they want, express themselves however they want with their own kind of, because usually it would be of the culture that they are, um, that's part of the show. Uh, like with the Inuit show, for example. And when when you do that, when you have that kind of trust and that kind of synergy, something really cool stuff happens. Like the the wrestling part, I would never have figured that that was something that would work really well when they when the two women are deciding to interact with each other and then that's how they do it. And so that was all them. That mm -hmm. was all the Silla singers. So that was dope. Yeah. So the interactive elements kind of uh, speak really, they speak really well to this, cultural work because it means that you as a creator can give them a tool which they can play with and you can step back and not necessarily force their their cultural expression in a certain direction exactly yeah that, that's why i kind of I, I like to use the word augmentation like mm -hmm. something's happening like you can never replace the humans those are that's what people are drawn to the person yeah. on the stage, like the movement, the feeling, and, the, and then you got human story. That's like the most important thing. And then the tech is like the augmentation over it that can create, I like to say metaphors, epiphanies or critiques and kind of take it to kind of like a surreal level in the same way that like when you're making a film, the performance and the story are the most important things but color correction would make it more vivid or VFX or, or sound design. It's, it's very similar. Like, so it's kind of like taking the best of film, theater, and kind of like the design process to make a unique show that uses the best bits out of those three kind of buckets. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, so have you ever worked with anything that's failed completely? Oh yeah, definitely. Uh, when the Tell second time it. we the second time we did dissolving self, it was at uh, for Isaiah, the International Symposium on Electronic Art, and we did a show. Our second show, thank God, it was just kind of like a a free festival, like it wasn't a ticketed event. But basically, we had the show, and then the software crashed, processing crashed, and it was just like my my partner's. Uh, a Mac uh, desktop, you know? And yeah, it sucked. We just had to kind of restart and and obviously cut that part out of the video and just mm -hmm. kind of restart from the very beginning. But sometimes that happens, like the ghost in the machine, there's no real reason that that should have happened, but it just does. Um, mm -hmm. And that's kind of like something you have to, when you're working with live data and interactive tech, especially if the output is a visual output that's reactive to something else, like sound, people are more forgiving because you can kind of fudge over that or play a, a track that can hide it or sound is a bit harder to perceive when, when it's visual, people never forget it. Um, so that's definitely happened, you know, and the, the key is just to kind of like, not to be too hard on yourself. And if you want to do avant-garde stuff, like on the edge at the border, at that trickster level, that's part of the game. You know, mm -hmm. it just it just is. And when it when it works really well, it's so cool. Like it's so I love when somebody comes up to me after a show and they what they think is interactive wasn't actually interactive hmm. and the inverse. So that's when I know I got them. Like, like they're they're totally wrapped up in the story. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. the tech to them felt like magic because they couldn't figure it out. And then they stopped trying because they were taken away by the human story on stage, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's all, it's all smoke and mirrors ultimately, which is uh -huh. again, it's, it's, it's an entire conversation that we had as one of our round tables was about when, when is interactivity necessary and when, uh, when is it not? So definitely in the pieces that you've, you've shared and that you've worked on, it's seemingly like a lot of it, those those intangible movements it like interactivity is so perfect for it because it's so expressive and it's not so much about a, a live performance aspect that you can like cue something you know so when yeah. you mix those two together it's uh it can be really really successful yeah yeah like the, the type of the type of shows i've done it's less about choreography and more about spontaneity 
Uh, mm -hmm. that's innate in the cultural practices that I've worked with. So, so yeah, it was a perfect blend for that and augmentation mm -hmm. of tech. Yeah. 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 Cause actually that's a good, that's a good choice of words. Cause choreography, if you're like very choreographed and you're blocked and you're a performer on stage, no, they're, they're going to be here. They're going to do this at that point. They're going to be over there. They're going to do that. And when they do that, you can just fire a cue. It's easier and probably better for your show if you just know that we just need to build a thing and it's going to happen when they hit that mark. Uh, but if they're not yeah. going to be specifically choreographed to hit those marks, then yeah, this interactive stuff, real nice. Exactly. Um, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, you got the last word. What would you like to share with the word world that you haven't said yet? I would say that um, it's, you know, I, I know that we can't do shows and I know people can't get together and all that stuff, but it is not a bad time for pre-production, like thinking about ideas, writing grants. So, you know, let that motivate you that you have the space to do that. Um, and another thing I try to think about with certain creative works is again, the idea of GE get it good enough and get it out there, start the conversation. And if you want to unlist it on YouTube, go ahead and do that after it's out, after you have a conversation or use it for support material on a grant, but always just trying to push the ball a little bit further and never feel married to any kind of medium, like um, change it around, flip it around. If there's an idea that you like, find the people who know more about it than you and try to write a grant and hire them. And that's that's the key, <laughs> yeah. you know. That's the way I've worked. So that would be my last word, last bit of advice for people in this crazy time. Awesome, it's great, 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 great advice. Thanks so much. Uh, this has been really wonderful. Thank you for coming out and sharing with us. And uh, um, yeah, thank you. Thank you for the invitation. And this has been an awesome conference level up. There's so much. Uh, I'm gonna watch a lot of these videos over and over again. It's totally up my alley. So I'm really glad. You guys did this and got that grant, so really cool. Thank you. Thanks so much.